Wisteria Monarch by Russell Legaspi At the far end of the coastal road of El Camino Real hid a dirt road, where Joan, with the warm Pacific sunset at her back, found at the edge of the road a view of a lonely wisteria. Behind it is a small cottage, as though conjoined twins attached to the tree. Since the day was fading, she etched the image in her memory and thought it best to explore some other day. It wasn't far from their summer home, and it was easy way back. As she turned away from the view of the wisteria, she felt a tickle of curiosity. The sway it made whispered to her, Come back. The next morning, she asked her mother who grew up visiting the town, Do you remember the wisteria at the end of El Camino? Joan said. Her mother shook her head and pursed her lips, even raised her shoulders, shaking the cobwebs off her memory. Joan's father was reading the morning papers and simply enjoyed the breeze of their summer vacation. Joan, same as yesterday, rode her bike. She took it upon herself like in the wisdom of her sixteen years, to venture forth when daylight struck its highest and head home before the sunset. Again, she found a dirt path, how it found her yesterday, and the curiosity grew, how it pulsated in her head, same as yesterday. This time she had breakfast, unlike last week when she hiked to town with only a piece of toast. While she drove her bike to the dirt path, keeping the wisteria in her sights. She wondered why she grew impatient with the town and why the beach had lost its allure within a week's time of their summer trip. As she approached the small cottage where the wisteria waited for her, she thought maybe the wideness of the Pacific was not enough, and maybe the music of the town was not playing the notes she wanted to hear. Can I help you? said an old lady from the open window of the cottage. Her cheekbones were round in her pleasant smile, and she wore a loose bun on her hair, with a pink blossom of wisteria stuck to it. Some silver stripes of hair and a few lines wrinkled her forehead. Hello, I saw the tree and that's a wisteria, right? I saw it from the road down, and I wanted to see if it was really a wisteria. I didn't know they grew in these parts, Joan said. The cheekbones of the old lady held high and round with her smile as she stared in the calmness that enwrapped the two of them. I'm so sorry to bother you, Joan added. Do you want some sour water, some biscuits? said the old lady, her smile focused on Joan. A black cat popped on the rim of the window and stretched its front legs. In full nonchalance found a place to round itself in between the two ladies. The little bell that hung from its red necklace jangled and Joan thought of pastry shops and donuts. She wandered her sights through the window and wandered furthermore inside. All the while, The old lady had brought out a glass of sour water with biscuits. It's lemonade, said Joan. The old lady turned and looked at Joan and kept a good smile. Thank you. It was really nice. Bye, said Joan. Then kicked the pedals of her bike, dusting the path of the dirt road with her speed. When she reached the coastal road of El Camino, Now far from the wisteria and the cottage and the old lady, now as she walked her bike, having her legs ache from the burst of pedaling, she remembered the old lady and the things inside her cottage. There were pictures, photographs, sketches, ink drawings, embroideries, etches, and models of a thousand butterflies. And from the window, The old lady, during the time of Joan's visit, brushed color on the butterfly wings. The pace of Joan's walk home slowed. 
She pointed the wonderful intricacies of the butterflies inside a cottage and matched them with the passing cars and colors of the beach. Though it was the height of noon, there was a strangeness that took over her. Joan paused. But then the grin-lit man on the traffic light beamed and it was time for her to walk. And did for the rest of the day. The cars melted outside and birds ebbed from the skies. It was the hottest day in the history of Joan as she woke the next day sweating more water than the ocean. Through the oven window of their summer house, she thought of the old lady, her butterflies, the cottage that housed them, and the tree that stood by them. Her bike waited for her instructions, but it too, like a lazy horse, would not step outside the stable doors. There was nothing she could do but view the world in her little corner. The sun hasn't peaked and already Joan was outside the cottage. The old lady was there to greet her from the open window and the cat too, still in nonchalance, rounded its back, flipped its tail then curled again. I'm sorry, I was rude and left the other day without properly saying thank you and goodbye, said Joan. Silly little swallow, come in. We don't want your pretty face to burn, do we now? said the old lady. A hush of giggle brought them together by the front porch, and the cat followed and stayed on the lap of the old lady. The old lady didn't talk much while she painted her butterflies. When she did, it was in little pockets of rest, after a bite of biscuit and sour water. Joan drank and placed a cool glass on her forehead. She just sat there with Mr. Bubbles, the cat, and watched the old lady paint life. Every now and then they would quiz each other, but for the most part, Mrs. Rose, Mrs. Ursula R. Rose, spent the whole afternoon finishing a small painting of an auburn butterfly, and would do this every day, every week, month, spring, summer, fall, every year, until it was time for butterflies to fly and move on. Joan could not grasp the magnitude of every day. It was unimaginable, and maybe that's what old people do, live their days doing the unimaginable things, every day, until they can't move anymore, until they can't anymore. Until I can't anymore said Mrs. Rose. Mr. Bubble squirmed itself out of Joan's sleeping embrace and continued inside the cottage. She had not realized the sky had turned like citrus fruit and it was time. Mrs. Rose had already gone inside with her painting materials and did not bother the good nap of Joan. You children should take more sour water and naps, she said as Joan waved from the window, peddling through the dimming sky. The voice of Mrs. Rose trailed, then gone. Time is funny, she thought. One day you have it, and next you have none. She walked her bike home, past the slumbering beach. Joan counted the stars in bloom and thought of the delicious nap she had with Mr. Bubbles, and the cradling brushstrokes of Mrs. Rose. Sunday morning came, and at the farmer's market, there in front of Joan stood Mr. Bubbles, staring at her, eyes like jewels. Mr. Bubbles, what are you doing here? Joan said. She crouched in her surprise, picked up the cat from its belly, and it hanged like black dough. Mr. Bubbles, like a toddler, Settled at Joan's shoulder, watched the rest of the market pass by. Look, Ma, she said. Where did you get that poor thing? Asked her mother. Out of Joan's arms, the shiny black cat slithered its way down to the pavement, then vanished in between the legs of people. Joan, as though chasing fish, aimed at the waving tail of Mr. Bubbles. Oh! Hey! Whoa! 
said People Joan passed. At the end of the market was a stall filled with the drawings and sketches of butterflies, shirts, wood etchings, prints, even dinner plates and coffee mugs. Joan recognized the sketches, and again, with the tickle of her excitement, at the other side of the table was Mrs. Rose. Her smile greeted the girl with ease. It reminded Joan of the sour water and the delicious nap. Here, you need this, said Mrs. Rose, extending a jar of sour water. Mr. Bubbles, at the end of the table, aimed its legs forward, curled its back, snug tight into a ball, safe in the middle of everyone's way. Are you here every Sunday morning? Joan asked. Sometimes, yes, when I have enough to give to people, Mrs. Rose said, as she handed her work to the people passing. What do you mean give? Joan said, her tone trying to overcome the forming crowd. Joan held the hands of Mrs. Rose. Wait, why are you giving these away for free? You worked hard for these, Joan said. The line lengthened, more butterflies in small canvases were given and taken away. Mrs. Rose could barely keep up. Without question, Joan stood by her and handed some artworks. The cat slept through it all and after a while, Joan had remembered her parents on the other side of the market. I'll be all right. You should go, said Mrs. Rose. Joan ran to her mother, who was juggling the oranges, and her father balanced the watermelons. She wiped her sweat and helped carry the rest home. She told them about Mr. Bubbles, about Mrs. Rose, and how people took the free butterfly artworks. It's her art. People should pay her for her hard work, Joan said, with a bit of redness and smoke from her nose. The noise of the market was gone and the ocean breeze found its way in her chest. Joan's mother rested her free hand on the girl's boiled head. I am sure Mrs. Rose has her reasons for giving away her work, said her father. But she worked hard for them, Joan said. I bet she did, and you're right. People should be giving her something for her work, her mother said. Art, Joan said correcting her mother. Yes, art. Maybe it's a promotional thing, continued her mother. Well, you know what? Ask her. You'll never know until you ask. That night, Joan went to bed with the thought of Mrs. Rose, her butterflies, what they meant, and thought of hard work and what it meant. She rolled around more, thinking, how can Mrs. Rose hold a serene smile while losing all her precious butterflies. If that was her winter's work, gone in a weekend or two, what does she get out of all that hard work? The next morning, the sun was tender on her cheeks, and the sound of the shore, too, was the right symphony to hear. She forgot about the flat tire of her bike, so Joan strolled by the beach below El Camino. Then found her way strolling to the wisteria. This time, she went around the cottage and held her head up, measuring the existence of this wild tree. When she gazed down at the finger-like roots, Mr. Bubbles, like a butler, attended her. Joan giggled and scratched her own nose as she does when something overly funny surprises her. <laughs> You're weird, Mr. Bubbles, Joan said. The cat stared at her, unmoving, as if waiting for an explanation, then licked its white soft right paw, the only white in this cat, then sprawled the licked paw, combing its ears. Come here through the back, shouted Mrs. Rose. The garish voice surprised Joan. From the back, she saw the wide open doors of the cottage. It revealed the corner studio of Mrs. Rose as though a closet filled with thousands of butterflies and thousands of canvases. Mrs. Rose, I don't remember these from the market, 
Joan said. They're special, but no more special than the ones I give away, said Mrs. Rose. With her reply, Joan remembered the ones given away. I'm sorry, Mrs. Rose, but I think you should price these. I mean, you worked hard and they're beautiful. Don't let people take advantage of you, said Joan. She took a deep breath, as though a race. Mrs. Rose held her smile high, wandered her eyes through her butterflies on the wooden floor and by the wall filled with butterflies, then ventured out to the wisteria tree. The absence of words unsettled Joan, while the old lady rested her soft gaze at the passionate child. You think I'm being taken advantage of? said Mrs. Rose. Well, I don't know. Maybe, Joan said. <laughs> you silly little swallow, said Mrs. Rose with her unsettling grin. Thank you. That's very thoughtful of you she added. There was something more Joan wanted to hear, but the comfortable meadow only took her words away. Mrs. Rose crouched down, caught the floor of her cottage, and sat there as though an image of a gardener after a long day of pruning. In her rest, she then straightened her back, chin up, hands to her knees. They're my people. This is my land. And those who are on my land deserve the beauty I make. As my subjects, the queen must provide her people with a beautiful life, said Mrs. Rose. Then laughed and slapped her thigh. <laughs> Think of it as charity, little swallow. There are things in this world that should be given away, Mrs. Rose continued. Hmm... I don't think that's fair. I mean, how will you live, eat, or get more painting materials? Joan answered. <laughs> At my age, you have the government for that. But really, one day you will realize you don't need a lot to live. <laughs> I guess that's how it is for my case. It was an image she could not grasp yet. But in a way, she understands the beauty of. They are like remedies, life remedies, she thought, incomprehensible objects, ideas that require time. Before Joan left home, Mrs. Rose handed her in an embroidered cloth a gift not to be opened until Sunday, which was still a few days away. Beautiful things live on, Mrs. Rose added. Joan left the blushing wisteria tree behind and its twin cottage. She cruised the road of El Camino with the glow of sunset, its brushstroke, and the tenderness of the Pacific breeze. Joan thought of all the beautiful things she could, and how, if they did, would live on. She tried to connect, like the blinking stars, wonderful things. Time words, colors, and Christmas presents. It was an idea that lightened her head, and by the time she found her room, she fell straight into the arms of her blanket and felt sinking deeper and deeper into an enchanting doze. Mrs. Rose wandered in her dreams, and the butterflies fluttered in between its pages. She waltzed around the wisteria tree while the butterflies swirled from under her. The pink sunset shone from afar. It was beautiful and free until people took the sunset's shine bit by bit. Like a giant pancake, people ate it. In her dream, the sun began to lose its brightness, so she tugged with the crowd. All the while, the butterflies flew into the sun to help it regain its glow. But as the sun did glow, the butterflies died in exchange. In confusion and desperation, Joan woke from her breathless dream. It was 4 a.m. and the sky was motionless, like the glass of water beside her. She recalled her dream and the images that shook her. From the foot of her bed, 
she sought a gift of Mrs. Rose. Yesterday exhausted her that she had forgotten it. Though she knew to wait until Sunday, a glitter of ideas sprinkled in her. Slowly, she pulled a taut knot and then loosened the string on her bed. The embroidered cloth followed after, daintily unfolding how it is meant to be, she convinced herself. Modern butterfly, Joan said, reading the handwriting below the watercolor painting. It was bigger than her two palms. Rather, each wing was the size of her palms open. It made an illusion that it was about to take flight off the small canvas. And for a moment, Joan thought it was fluttering its paper-thin wings. In fear, she wrapped the painting again, tightened the string to how it was before. Joan gazed at the moon, napping with the clouds beside it. It was difficult to shut her mind after opening the gift. She faced the corners of her bed in different angles, but the image of the monarch butterfly stayed fluttering in her half-sleep. It was excitement and curiosity, but mostly a sensation of height, a place beyond the reach of her legs. She had to see Mrs. Rose. She would answer why things are given away and how beauty lives on, how thoughts grow in the middle of a meadow like a wild wisteria tree stuck beside a cottage. By the time the sun peeked at the horizon, Joan was dressed. With her newly repaired bike, she kicked the pedals and broke off. She found the fastest way to El Camino and knew the most even path on the dirt. Joan felt the wind behind her. At a sight of the wisteria tree, she squeezed the brakes, dust flying from her tires, grooving the surface of the dirt road. Joan demanded an explanation for the tree and why Mr. Bubbles sat quietly under it. Joan could not explain how unsettling yet exciting the sight was. Repeatedly she blinked, and repeatedly she jutted her eyes, making sure what was in front of her was not part of an overextending dream. She trotted the path around the tree, mesmerized at the elaborate design the tree has become. Was it always like this, or is there a celebration, she thought. At the back of the cottage where Mrs. Rose would be working even the earliest of times, her laughter continued. She called for Mrs. Rose in the mix of her giggles. <laughs> Mrs. Rose, why are your paintings hanging on the wisteria? I don't get it. What's up, Mrs. Rose? Joan said. Mr. Bubbles unfurled from its round state, straightened its front legs, and from the root, climbed the next height of the tree. Mrs. Rose, you all right? With the back door closed, Joan jogged to the front, where it was also closed. From the window she tried tapping, and from the other window she called for anyone hurt, sick, or injured. A bit of fear simmered inside Joan as she went round. She searched for reasons why the cottage has dimmed from inside, and why and how could all of Mrs. Rowe's works be outside, hanging on the wisteria? She drove her bike home and thought to return a few hours later. Maybe Mrs. Rose had gone to the market or someplace where old people like her would go, she thought. Two more times Joan went back that day, but to no avail. She was beginning to imagine her walking, making the floors creak and calling out her name. Joan turned the doorknobs this way and would turn it the other way, but still there was no answer. Even Mr. Bubbles disappeared at times. Only when its bells jangled as it hopped on the branches of the pink tree that Joan knew where the black cat was. Thursday came and went by. Friday had a bit of showers, yet still no drop of Mrs. Rose. Worry has stayed with Joan. Even when her mother calmed her and said people go places and old people are no different. The theaters, friends, groceries, and the beach added her mother. But all this didn't come close to the wisteria in its twin cottage. Impatient came Saturday and Joan thought maybe there was a letter, a note, a message, or a clue behind her gift. 
Joan opened it, fingers fencing the found only disappointment and more worry. Worse than her nightmare, she thought. Saturday heated up. Joan jumped on her bike and rode again to Mrs. Rose. She found a wisteria tree, the thousands of monarch butterflies hung, at rest, stacked and tied. Mr. Bubbles, the master, lazy. Its queen is still somewhere near. Maybe she was, Joan thought. Otherwise, Mr. Bubbles would have died in hunger. Through the back door, she went again like a thief, turned it slower than Mr. Bubbles, waiting for the right click. It opened, she said. Woke the cat sleeping on the highest branch of the tree. Mr. Bubbles, it opened. Come on, Joan added. The work tables that doubled as her dinner table were moved to the side. The chairs, the ironing board, the laundry basket, all of it to the side, as if to give away. All arranged in a way for this lumbering brown thing in the middle. It was as if someone else's cottage. Joan could not take another step at the sight of this stiff mud-like pile that stuck in the middle. It felt like dirt on her fingers, like a cardboard box shaped into a banana, hanging at the ceiling or more like a mound of dirt grown from the ground. Maybe this was the new project of Mrs. Rose. This dirt sculpture should explain her absence. Sunday came like a breeze, a lighter tickle on her neck. It was gentle and feathery, something close to a half-dream. On her nightstand, the gift of Mrs. Rose unstrung with the embroidered cloth covering. The cloth made a flick, like a hand jolting, then folding. Half dream, she thought. People in waking get these. The cloth thumps again, and again. Joan kicked the pedals of her bike. Though her knees burned, she kicked more, pedaling, kicking, pedaling, and kicking. Sometimes kicked the ground, sometimes pedaled the air. Her feet slipped from the pedals, but her breath and eyes heaved forward. Mrs. Rose, Mrs. Rose, Mrs. Rose, she said the whole race. She held the empty canvas tight on her chest and recalled how the monarch butterfly from the surface of the canvas under the embroidered cloth with its black lines, palm-shaped wings, auburn colors, heading towards the day spill from the window, began to animate, then flutter away. The sky of the wisteria was brushed with the same auburn colors. From the tree, the hung canvases, like a rooftop of messenger pigeons, unleashed the cloud of butterflies. The monarch butterflies filled the sky like smoke rising from the cottage of Mrs. Rose, like a thousand kites waved by the wind. She found the door already opened. Mr. Bubble sat at the front porch where Mrs. Rose would have painted. The black cat with determined eyes, as if counting the swarm, managed the parade, supervised the flight coordination. She found the door already opened. The gliding monarchs welcomed her. Joan found the brown dirt mound in the middle of the cottage split open, like the banana shape it was, like a giant cocoon, she thought. A dozen more butterflies came out of the mound. They made their way up to the cottage towards the window, towards a cloud of butterflies dancing up in the clouds. While some stayed on the plates, on the jars and hanging lights, Joan followed a trail of dirt footsteps that carved out the back. There she saw Mrs. Rose, wrapped in a quilt. Monarchs crowned her head, monarchs ran her cape-like quilt. Just in time for the parade, what do you think? Mrs. Rose said. Lost for words, Joan sat on the edge of the step and memorized the age look of Mrs. Rose. The black parts of her hair had silvered, and the lines on her forehead and eyes drew deeper and longer, as if time had marched her forward, maybe five or seven years older. What happened, Mrs. Rose? You look... asked Joan. My, my, little swallow, said Mrs. Rose, adding more lines to her kind smile. To make beautiful things, you have to give your life to it. 
They watched the sky paraded by monarchs, being taken by the wind somewhere far where Joan could no longer see them. How about some sour water and biscuits? said Mrs. Rose. The queen of butterflies then smiled the roundness of her cheekbones.